Word of God for our consideration this morning comes to us from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. We pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, fellow lambs in the good shepherd's flock, That hymn we just sang didn't make any sense, did it? How can someone be both a prince and a slave at the same time? How can someone be a a sword bringer and a peacemaker all at once? What in the world is an everlasting instant? It's called the Christus Paradox, that hymn. It describes the the wonderful and yet sometimes confusing paradoxes of the Christian faith. And and the climax of the, the confusion, the mystery, the paradox of Christianity is none other than Jesus himself. And today we get to consider one of those those dear paradoxes, one of the most comforting and, and endearing paradoxes to us. The fact that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is also the Good Shepherd who leads us through this world to His side in heaven. It it doesn't seem to make sense on the surface that a lamb could be a shepherd. You would think a, a helpless little lamb makes for a pretty pathetic shepherd. But our salvation hangs on this paradox. And the good news today is that when we when the Lord opens our eyes to to embrace the Lamb as our shepherd, He's going to help us understand some of the very real paradoxes that we face in our lives too. The author of Revelation, the Apostle John, was no stranger to the, the paradoxical, troubling, puzzling life of a Christian in this world. He was the same one who recorded Jesus' promise in our gospel lesson, that wonderful promise. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And yet as John was writing these words in Revelation roughly 60 years later, it'd be hard to blame him if he was having a few doubts about that promise. See, John had already witnessed the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire in 70 A.D. He had seen Christians forced from their homes, persecuted, separated from their families because of the the empire-wide persecution that was going on. He had been the longest living of the apostles because the rest of the apostles had been murdered for preaching the gospel of Christ crucified. And if that weren't bad enough, 
As John wrote these words, saw this vision, he was isolated, exiled on the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea, far from his friends, far from his fellow Christians. And so I I don't really think John was humming, I am Jesus' little lamb to himself, as he was on that island knowing that in the rest of the Roman Empire there was a systematic persecution of the Christian church going on. He was well aware of the paradox of of being a Christian, of, of following Christ who is the very Son of God, who reigns in heaven above all and over all, and yet feeling like you are isolated and alone. And John's not alone either, is he? As I look out at the flock gathered here, I don't see sleek, strong, self-sufficient sheep. If that were true, you wouldn't be here. I don't see people who don't need or want a good shepherd, who would be just fine on their own. I see people who have undergone the, the, the harsh realities of life in this world, who are beaten and broken. I see it in the the eyes that look tired, the gray hairs, the new limps. Every wrinkle on our face tells a story about us, doesn't it? How we've been beaten up and broken by the world, by a devil that is after us. John's not alone in, in thinking that maybe what Jesus says is too good to be true. Maybe, maybe it was just a, a story he was telling them that he was our good shepherd. And, and it's easy for the, the struggles of life to turn into real doubt and even maybe unbelief. If I am really Jesus' little lamb, why is it hurting so badly? Why won't he just take the pain away? If I am Jesus' little lamb, why, why every time I get, seem to get one step forward financially does he make me take two steps back? Why can I never progress in my career? If Jesus is really a good shepherd, why does he let so many sheep stray from his fold only to be attacked and beaten by the wolves of this world? Maybe we get to the point where we say, Lord, I, I'm done with this. Why don't you just take me out of this life? And I I wish I could, but I can't answer those questions for you. But here's what I can say. The book of Revelation is for you if you're struggling with suffering in life. See, a, a lot of people think, don't even try to read the book of Revelation. It's too weird, too mysterious. There's too many crazy, th- crazy things. There's dragons and all sorts of other imagery. You've got to stay away from it. Let the real professionals read it. Well, it's very simple. The book of Revelation is extremely simple. The message is Jesus wins. Jesus wins over sin, death, and the devil, and through him, we believers are victorious too. That's the message. The The difficulty comes in when when through this vision, Jesus describes the real battle that is going on in our world. And the real battle that is going on is not what you see in the headlines. It's not the the latest tweet that that has come out from the president. It's It's not any kind of foreign trade issue. The real battle that is going on is between Christ and the devil, and it is for your soul. And the book of Revelation provides us with a bird's eye view of that, of what's actually going on in our world. And and a lot of it is very scary. A lot of it is showing how the devil really has this world in his his hand. How he is controlling the levers of power to to attempt to destroy the church if that were possible. But in this section, at the end of Revelation chapter 7, the Lord provides a little bit of a reprieve, a little bit of a break for John and for us. Instead of showing the the horrors of what is going on in battlefield earth, 
He shows us the church triumphant in heaven. And what does the church look like? What does it look like in heaven even right now? Well, it looks a lot like God always said it would, right? Remember way back when, 2,000 years before Jesus, when the Lord said to Abraham, who was old and without children, he said, I am going to make your descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Unlikely. How could that happen? And what does John see? A multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. This looks like a victory celebration, doesn't it? They're dressed in white robes. They're gathered around the throne of their king. They have palm branches in their hand, a a sign of of victory. And they're not mourning. They're not singing a dirge. They're not uh, gathered at a funeral. They're singing a song of victory. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on his throne and to the Lamb. It looks like a family reunion. All of the believers who have gone before us, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Paul, all of the Christians throughout all the centuries since, all of the Christians that you have had to say goodbye to, gathered there around the throne, no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain. It's an incredible vision of what is really happening. Why would, why would Jesus show this to, to John? John was still on this earth, still suffering. Was he just trying to rub John's face in the fact that he wasn't there in heaven? That maybe the other apostles were, but, but he was still suffering? The Lord wants to teach us something about the trajectory of the Christian life, about the path that he is leading us on through this world. And it comes out in that, uh, that brief interaction between the elder and between John. The elder asks John, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And, and put yourself in John's shoes. John is suffering. He kind of feels like he's all alone. He's been abandoned. And, and the Lord is showing him heaven and the church in heaven. And he asks him, Where did these people come? Where do you think these people came from? Do you, do you think that that they led perfectly calm and peaceful lives on this earth, that they never had a single hiccup, and that because because of that, because of how good they were as Christians, that's why they're in heaven? Well, John wisely responds. He says, sir, you know. In other words, he says, I could take a stab at guessing who these people are, but I would rather leave it to you to tell me. And the answer is remarkable, isn't it? These are they who have come out which is a very bad translation. It should be our coming out. It's a present tense verb. Our coming out of the great tribulation. And if you've read any popular Christian books on the end times today, that word tribulation is used quite often to, to refer to a supposed brief period of very hard times for the church in this world, followed by a, a, a secret rapture of believers out of this world. But I I mention the tense of that verb because it's very important in our understanding of it. It's an ongoing coming out of the tribulation. So the picture is not that that someday planes are going to be flying and and taxis are going to be driving and all of a sudden their drivers are going to be taken away. No, the, the picture is that all around the world, day after day, believers are dying one by one by one and they're being whisked out of this world of sorrow to the glory of heaven. That's the picture of the Christian life, of the trajectory that we are all on. The promise is not that we will have perfect peace and perfect happiness and perfect health right now. The promise is that one day our Good Shepherd will call us out of this place and take us to his side in heaven. Is that how we view life? Is that the lens through which we see the troubles that we face on a daily basis? Are we we resolved that this life is not going to be what we want it to be, but that the, the glory that is to come is greater than anything that we can even comprehend? Or... 
have, has our view of heaven been dimmed a little bit? Have we become short-sighted so that we don't see what the Lord has in store for us? All we see is what is right in front of us. You may have, have heard that our generation, and, and it's, it's all generation of Americans alive right now, we, we have a, a fear of suffering maybe more than any American generation to come before us, we do not accept the fact that we will have pain or, or any kind of hardship or any kind of struggle in life. And our, our generation is infamous for, for doing whatever it takes to get rid of the pain. An example would be the drugstores that are filled with, with every kind of remedy for every kind of pain you could ever feel on earth. And it, it's not that that's wrong to seek pain relief, but sometimes our world goes to the extent of sinning to relieve that pain, to avoid the pain. For example, the, you know there is an opioid epidemic sweeping through our nation. The abuse and the misuse of, of prescription painkillers has that toxic tide swept into any of our homes so that we are misusing or abusing painkillers. Marriage, the, the union of, of two sinful people, is bound to be a pressure-filled situation. It's bound to be a daily struggle. And the world says, you know what? It's not worth the struggle. Pull the release cord, choose divorce, and get out of it. If the struggle is too much, it's not worth it. Life is too short to struggle through marriage. Raising children, especially disciplining them, is hard. It's hard. It's not easy. It's work. And you know our, our world says, if that's not what you want at this time, you have every right to kill that baby before it ever takes its first breath, or even, apparently, right after it's taken its first breath. Now, I don't think that that would ever, I pray that would never cross our minds, but it is tempting as a parent to say, this is hard work. Maybe I can pay someone else to do the child raising. Maybe, maybe I can download an app on my iPad and that will do the raising of my child for me. It is so tempting to, to shirk the duty of parenting because it is so hard. It's not unusual that we feel all these pressures. That's, that's the word. The pressure for tribulation is thlipsis in the Greek. It's... it's it, the, the picture is of pressure crushing you, both on the inside and the outside. And we all feel those pressures, right? And, and again, even, even our world is, is at the point where it says, if, if life is just too hard, you ought to have the right to ask a doctor to help you end it. But that's not what Jesus had said. Jesus didn't promise us that life would be without struggle and without suffering. He said to his disciples in the book of John, he said, in this life, you will have trouble. Paul and Peter agree. Paul said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Peter's whole first epistle is about Christians as they are suffering and what hope they can have. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so the cross of suffering, of pain, of hard work in this life is not optional. It is not something we can choose to avoid or choose to drop. It is a reality for us as Christians. The path that Jesus blazed is the path that we must all walk. First the crown, first the cross, and then the crown. And every single one of us gets to that point where we throw our hands up in the air and say, I, Lord, I don't know how I can go on. It's, it's too much for me to withstand. The pressure is too much. I cannot go on. I cannot hold on to my faith. How can we do it? And that, that's the point of this text from Revelation. 
That's why the elder is saying, look at these saints in heaven. Where do you think they came from? They didn't have easy lives. A lot of them were killed for their faith. That's how it will go. But look at where they are now. How did they get there? How did they get to that point where they are worshiping the Lamb around the throne and there are no more tears or suffering or pain? There's one thing that unites them all, right? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Another aspect of our modern day culture is that we keep blood and sickness and death locked away, far away from us. Whereas previous generations butchered their own food, we don't see that anymore. Whereas previous generations had grandma and grandpa in the house until they died, we don't see that anymore. We keep that locked away in antiseptic nursing homes. We don't see death until it's been painted up with makeup. But the Old Testament people of God were very familiar with death. Beginning at Passover, God required his people to sacrifice lambs and goats and, and bulls day after day, thousands upon thousands of them, to teach them this very important lesson, this twofold lesson. First, as you gathered your family around on, on the Passover celebration, and everyone from, from the youngest child to the oldest adult was there, and you slit the throat of that lamb in front of your family, the message was unmistakable. The wages of sin is death. Something must die to pay for the sins that we have committed. But the, other, the second part of the message was equally vivid, right? You didn't die. That lamb did. That lamb took your place as your substitute. And so we see even that, that truth, that great law and gospel truth here in heaven, in our vision of heaven. The saints, are they, are they going around patting each other on the back saying, oh, you were so faithful, Peter. Oh, you were so awesome in your life as a Christian. You never stumbled once. No, they are worshiping the Lamb. That's what it means when they say salvation belongs to our God who is on the throne and to the Lamb. They are saying Salvation is completely the work of God, His gift to us, something we can only receive. And so if that is the case, if the, if the case is that only those who have perfectly white robes, meaning have perfectly spotless, sinless lives, can stand before the throne, how do we get that? How do we get the standing before God that we need to enter heaven? Washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb. There's another paradox, right? Blood doesn't take stains out. Blood stains normally. In some churches throughout history, there has been artwork depicting what is described in these verses. And, and what you will see quite often is a, a, a perfectly spotless white lamb. And one of its legs will be, will be wrapped around a cross and right at the jugular of that lamb, there will be a, a, a wound. And out of that wound will be flowing blood. And that blood will be flowing out of that spotless white lamb into a chalice. And the message is clear, right? The only way to wash your robe, to wash away your sins, is to drink the blood of the lamb. That's what we do at Holy Communion. We drink the blood of the Lamb which was shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. That's in fact what we do in confession. What are we doing in confession? When you stood up uh, just a few minutes ago, you were presenting your dirty laundry to the Lamb of God and saying, I cannot clean the stains myself. You must do it for me. And He does. Every single time he does, he, 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 his blood washes away the sins of the world. His blood washes away all of your sins. But even more than that, confession is, is not just admitting the times we have violated God's law. It is also 
pleading with him and, and, and offering him the pressure and the stresses that we feel from this life of tribulation. When we confess our sins, we're confessing, Lord, I can't go on. If it's, if it's up to me, I cannot do this. I cannot have the strength to go on in this marriage. I cannot raise these children on my own. I cannot face this pain, whether it be emotional or psychological or physical. I cannot do it on my own. And that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do, isn't it? You know, Peter put it so well in his first letter, chapter 5. He said, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And so the, the picture of confession and coming to communion I want you to see here is, well, it's Mother's Day. So picture a child who is hurting, tears streaming down their faces, they're bleeding somewhere, they're crying, running and jumping into their mother's arms with a full expectation that mom is going to make it all better. That is the picture of confession. That is why we look forward to it, to cast all of our sins, all of our anxieties on Christ, the Lamb of God. But I was thinking about that as I was writing, and I was thinking, if you are actually a mother, that might not be all that comforting of an image. Because you're all too familiar with your whole family running to you, jumping on you, and expecting you to fix all of their problems. Is there anyone in this world who feels more flipsis, more pressure from inside and out than mothers? You've got to know where every single thing in the house is, right? You've got to prepare every single meal. You've got to fix every owie. You've got to heal every wound. You have to know all of the answers to all of your children's homework. You have to operate the equivalent of a small business out of your home, keeping the budget balanced, keeping the pantry full. You have to know what tomorrow holds. You have to put up with us husbands who, on the rare occasion that we are actually listening, don't seem to understand what you're talking about. Your tribulation is 24-7. You don't get a break. I saw a card, a Mother's Day card, that, that showed the job application for a mother, and it said, what, we only get one day off? And the, the, the interviewer said, yeah, you get that day off, but you actually are working on Mother's Day too. Where, where's the good news for you mothers here? You know what it's like to be the shepherd. You even know what it's like to be the lamb to sacrifice for your family. Where's the good news for you? The good news is this, that the lamb is your shepherd too. The lamb of God laid down his life for you, for your failures in mothering. For the times where you feel like just giving up. For the times maybe you did give up. You mothers especially need to take that time every day to be with your good shepherd, to read his word, because then you will be assured that you are not doing this alone. Even as you lead the little lambs by the hand, your Savior is leading you by the hand through this life. Because the lamb is our shepherd, and the lamb is our shepherd both now and forever. See in these words the trajectory of life. It is not going to be perfect for us now. It's going to be a struggle. Everywhere we turn, our careers, our marriages, our families, our health, our wealth, it's all going to be a daily struggle made all the worse because we follow Christ and the devil and the world want nothing more than to rattle us out of our faith. But the good news is that your shepherd goes with you every step of the way. That's why the Lord showed this vision to John, to show him what is really happening, what is really true, where this road really leads. Just as Christ had to carry his cross, and now he is wearing the crown on the throne in heaven, so now for just a little while, just a little while, we are carrying our crosses as we follow our Savior with the assurance that this is where it leads. Keep this picture in your mind all day. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. 
And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. May this vision of heaven's glory that awaits us give you the greatest paradox, the rarest paradox in this world. And that is peace and joy even in the midst of tribulation. Amen.